As you are aware, we are in the Advent season, which I know we all look forward to every year. It's a wonderful time. And uh, we light the Advent candles, and you'll recall that the first one we lit was the candle of hope. Remember that? Amen. And then last week, we lit the candle of what? Peace. Peace. And today, we are going to light the candle of what? Joy. Joy. No cattle 
the yearlings didn't survive the winter, perhaps. Uh, you see what he's saying? He's saying, Lord, I'm saying to you, no matter what happens to me, no matter what comes down the pipe and affects my life and my family, still, I will exalt in you. I will lift up my joy to you and my worship to you and my glory to you. In fact, we sometimes look around and we can find all kinds of excuses of why not to have joy. Maybe you don't have a job. Maybe we got laid off. Maybe your checking account's overdrawn. The car, I mentioned last week, having the car not paid for it and having it break down. That's what that's really brought Familiar family, family members seriously sick. I, you know what I'm talking about. We have this stuff all the time. It's part of life. We can use those things as excuses as to why not to have joy. We can almost get mad at God, perhaps, and say, God, you chose to give me and told me you would give me the abundant life. Jesus told us that, didn't he? I come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Amen. And we can go back to God and say, God, how come all of these things are going wrong in my life or, or these things aren't working? And you said that I would have the abundant life. So we can come up with excuses, but still, I think you see that the choice is ours. I want us to, uh, I'm going to read a passage of scripture out of uh, Philippians that I know that you are familiar with. But I want us to put it in, this, in the perspective of choosing to have joy in the Lord. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So saying rejoice is the same as saying have joy in. Have joy in the Lord always. Again, I say have joy. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. Well, I want to tell you, if I made my living uh, with a fig orchard or with a grape vineyard or with cattle and I saw them dying and failing and rotting on the vine, I might be a little anxious. Wouldn't you? I mean, we'd look around and say, wait a minute, what? Lord, what's happening here? But he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now remember I told you a moment ago that in Advent, the hope and the peace and the joy and the love work together. You're going to begin seeing it here. Where he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is, if you rejoice in the Lord and are anxious for nothing, then the peace of God comes in. He goes on in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is anything excellent and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. So, Paul, in the book of, in his letter to the Philippians, talks about, listen folks, we don't just worship the Lord when everything's going well. We don't just exalt and, and glorify the Lord when everything's going good for our life. You see what I'm saying? We tend to have a reactions to the way things are going on around us. Uh, for example, if, you're, if you ever have marital problems, you'll know it's very difficult sometimes to, to really get excited about what the Lord's doing when you and your spouse are having difficulties. And that's why when you're having difficulties as husband and wife, that must be a priority in your life to deal with. And all of the other things that come our way, God wants us to have joy. He wants us to have peace. He wants us to have hope. But it starts with us making a choice. I'm going to turn to Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12, it begins in verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. 
and he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation, and in that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitants of Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Have you ever uh, read much in the book of Job? You know the story of Job? If there was ever a guy in the Bible that I would have to say, No, oh, buddy, you may, you may really have a, a good case there. Because, I mean, if there was anything that could go wrong, it went wrong in his life, didn't it? Remember the story? Amen. I mean, he lost his cattle, he lost his fields, lost his children. I, I mean, he lost everything. And the only thing, and, oh, and then, and then to make matters worse, what happened to him personally? He got boils all over his body. And he's sitting at, around the campfire, scraping his boils with pieces of clay. Whoa, that's pretty horrible. And he says, he makes this, this interesting statement. He says, I came into this world with nothing. And if God chooses me to take me out of this world with nothing, so be it. But I will still give thanks and praise unto the Lord. Wow. Amen. What a testimony is that? Amen. And you can lose his purportedly to be probably the richest man in the world. One of the problems with us understanding all about Job is it's probably the oldest book of the Bible. We don't know where he fits in with, with uh, Hebrews and other countries. And he's just this godly man, this righteous man who knows God. And uh, we find that he loves God with an everlasting love. And no matter what happened, and then you remember the story, his friends came. Remember his friends? And they said, Joe, buddy, listen, I hate to be the one to tell you this. This is lost cause. You're done. Now, you remember at the beginning of the book, what was the cause for all of his trouble? Who remembers? Satan. And this is another passage of scripture I've never quite understood because it, said that, it says that Satan went in to the presence of the Lord and said, I've noticed your servant Job down there. And God said, yes, Job is a righteous man. And he said, yes, but I'll bet you if you took away all those things from him, he wouldn't be praising you in such a righteous man anymore. So would God say, go ahead. You can do whatever you want to Job, except you can't take his life. But you can take away everything. And so Satan was in all of this. 